Well, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you coming. My speech is about my life in <coughs> Fokker. Since World War One, the name Fokker has been known worldwide from the very special role he played in aviation. I was privileged to fly F-27-100 through to 500 series, F-28-1000, 4000. And on the Fokker jets, I spent a total of 18 years. I saw Tango Foxtrot Lima arrive in Perth on Wednesday, the 16th of December, 1959. Never thought or hoped I'd be flying that aircraft five years later as Mike Mike Sierra. I joined MMA in 1964 and was endorsed on the DC-3. This is coming into land at Tom Price, as you can see. I did my training and endorsement with Colin Cook, who was a first-class pilot. He was natural. And my being slim, I had to really strain in the seatbelt because I was not filling the seatbelt. But I had to push my legs so far forward to get 180 pounds foot pedal pressure to keep the DC-3 straight. By the end of that year, I was doing an F-27 course. Brian Bailey is in the centre of the photograph there. And he was sadly lost in the Viscount crash near Port Hedland in December 1968. Brian was always positive. He was a bomber pilot in World War II. And he was a great example for me to follow. His decisions were simple, correct. The F-27 was much easier to fly than the DC-3 with a ball system, comprehensive and logical. Also, it had better seating, and I handled the single engine operations a lot better. In late 1966, MMA's DC-3 fleet grew from six to eight. The F-27s from two to four. The rapid increase in pilots went from 72 to 138, all in just two and a half years. But then the WA government cut off all subsidies to fruit and veggies in the north and the outback. The DC-3s went straight through to Melbourne, plus one F-27. The port declined from 110 ports down to 34. Pilots went from 138 to 85. And at least 200 engineers were unceremoniously pushed out the door. Yet the Pilbara continued with the great need for air and road transport. MMA added an F-27-100 from the Philippine Airlines and it was registered MMU. With 514 engines, it was less power by, than the F-27-200 series. It was 30 knots slower than MMS and it had no autopilot. So it was promptly named Mike, Mike Useless. <laughs> These uh, Rolls-Royce engines use water methanol. The water evaporated in the compressors to increase the density of the air and the methanol of 40% went to restore the power of the engine at ISA at whatever elevation the aerodrome was, pressure altitude. The speeds were slower, but the payloads were good on the 200 series. And they increased the power, the weight that it could uplift. MMU was delegated to Kalgoorlie, Norseman, Esperance, Albany and Perth, or up the coast of Port Hedland. It filled the gap and it did the job. MMS was a special aircraft throughout its life. It was the fastest in the F-27 fleet through an answer, by at least 10 knots faster. It also flew the first 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 hours of any F-27 in the world. And this came by flying out of Perth at midnight, six nights a week, through to Darwin, and back again by 10.30 at night to go out again at midnight. On August the 3rd, 1994, at 35 years of age, Mike Mike Sierra went to Chile 
for 72,000 hours, 69,500 landing cycles. Meanwhile, the F-27 structure was credited by being increasing its takeoff weight by 3,500 pounds. The takeoff weight then became the maximum landing weight, and the maximum landing weight then became the zero fuel weight. The night skies in the 1960s were very quiet. So an northbound F-27, we considered we were probably the only aircraft airborne at that time in all of Western Australia. An occasional BOAC 707 from Singapore through Perth, Sydney to Auckland might be the only one because all other aeroplanes generally were VFR unless there was a loan by a doctor somewhere. On March the 9th, 1966, NASA chartered us to fly a group up to Canada that had a special communication system. They had, I think it was five aerial towers that they could lower down in the case of the cyclone. The Canaveral was special for NASA, being the only communication between South America, then there was parks in New South Wales, Canaveral, and nothing until South Africa. So from South America to South Africa, Australia had two vital points. On the flight to Canaveral, it was commissioned by NASA. In the middle is Commander Wally Schirrar, American Navy astronaut who'd done the Gemini and Mercury programs. But he was the first astronaut who had been in space to come to Carnarvon. George Meadows invited him up front, which he was very pleased to accept, and they had much to talk about. South of Shark Bay and to the east of Denham was an area of land that was cleared. And they put lines of white, yellow sand, north and south, and east and west. They're probably about 20 or 30 blocks of sand. And that was to see how well astronauts could identify something from space as they traveled past. So for me, maybe Wally Shirai was a very special trip we can do. Well, the DC-3s flew up to 10,000 feet in the bottom of all the bad weather. The F-27 flew from 15 to 20,000. In the middle of all the bad weather was icy. When the F-28s came, they would fly from 20 to 25, 30,000, generally above most of the weather, so we could see between the clouds and weave in and out to ourselves and passengers the ride. The arrival of the F-28s, the F-27s flew up the coast of Port Hedland and then across the Marble Bar and Alagine Roy Hill. And from there we could see the special World War II bomber boats that Corona down. These aircraft would come from Perth or Perth through Corona down, then to Columbaroo or Darwin to carry the fourth fight further north, into Borneo, the targets in Indonesia. Now I'll give you some unusual weather conditions that were experienced. F-27 flights over Marble Bar, even at 20,000 feet. The magnetic compass, which was not gyro-stabilised like the other compasses, would turn 10 degrees to the left, would sit there for two to three minutes, while we passed over this area, and then it would resume its normal heading. So what was in the ground below, we never knew. But there was something that was very significant. In the mid-1960s, an F-27 arrived over Derby at midnight. Turned left downwind to land on runway 11, and they were going very fast. So they turned early, got to be on final F-11, and we're going very slow. They didn't know why, but future investigation revealed the southeasterly wind at a thousand feet was about 60 knots. That's caused by a very strong high pressure system in the boat that stubbornly pushes all the lows and the rain south beyond it. And 
with you with those easterly winds, and you have a high pressure system up there holding the winds down, they were very strong indeed. So that word went around and we learned something about the weather condition. In the 1950s, a DC-3 left Derby for Perth. And uh, being wet known, the NDB was a long way off. But when they were able to get some reasonable location on Mekathara NDB, they kept pointing off to the right. Being at night, they were on top of cloud. And they were looking, they couldn't find anything until they realised there was a short strip of lights below them. Turned out to be Walona, 100 miles east of Mekatara. So had they continued on, they would have finished up somewhere between Meriden and Southern Cross. So after that, DC-3 and F-27 pilots taken off from Derby or Broome would always turn 10 degrees to the right in anticipation that if there were strong westerly winds that lower down, they wouldn't get caught out. It's easier to be upwind and drift back onto track rather than be downwind and try and scramble back to it. An F-27 day flight expert in clear skies, 19,000 feet. When it reached Mount Magna, it entered turbulence. The aircraft squirmed, shook, bucked around until we, I was in it, got to Mekathara. So it was Harold Rail. We didn't know then, though it soon became clear. Another F-27 night flight expert. We'd set course and climbing to 19,000 again, which was the 200 series favourite altitude. Exactly 60 minutes later, we were over Mekathara. So a 240 knot aircraft climbing and cruising 350 nautical miles in one hour, we knew something very important was there. The tailwinds were well over 100 knots. <coughs> and that same night, TAA sent a 727 from Perth to Hobart, which was an unusual flight, and he got there in three and a half hours. These were the emerging signs of jet streams. At higher levels, and as I've just explained, lower levels. It soon became normal when all high-flying aircraft gave air reps that included winds and temperature at the higher levels. And so the Met Office got them and with a map of Australia built squares on which the wind reports at that particular point was built up a bit like a tall tower so that we could then plan for better altitudes and directions. And my son was flying for Qantas and leaving Melbourne for South Africa. He said we would go almost down to the Antarctic white shelf to keep away from the jet streams. So by going down, you might get a higher fuel consumption, but you might get a much lower headwind. So these headwinds identified winds at the higher altitudes. Not only was it important to know about the jet stream, where they were and their strength, but it also ensured that we knew the areas of wind shear and turbulence. And what may not be understood is these jet streams just don't go like a bullet because they twist and squirm and they're changing all the time. It's a bit like a hose in a swimming pool. You turn it on. And that's how it goes. On a flight from Caratha by Gerald to Perth one afternoon, we were down the track about an hour, and I had a 30 degree drift angle at 420 knots in the F 28. We were picking up 15 knot tailwind, so I calculated the wind to be. 310 degrees at 215 knots. Well, MMJ was the aircraft that we got. In June 69, I was in Essendon doing the first F-28 course in Australia. After four weeks, we knew something about the Garrett Air Research ABU, 
which funded 70,000 RPM. We also knew of flight directors, progress annunciators, the speed brake, lift bumpers, and much more. The electrics were comprehensive, yet simple and clear, with a good logical overhead <coughs> panel layout. Rolls-Royce engines were modified versions of what they use in the Air Force and the Royal Navy in the UK. Its basic actual flow, one-to-one -one bypass ratio, meant that it was rugged and gave the F-28 a robust and reliable power plant. My five-year progress was truly remarkable since I joined the airline. Going from the 150-knot DC-3, 240-knot F-27, to 435 F-28. That meant that what I never dreamed of, on the DC-3s, we took seven hours derby to Perth, and F-27 took four hours 30. The F-28 took two hours 40. You might gather that I was impressed with the F-28. <coughs> Mike Mike Julia was from rather than safe in Norway. Falcon test pilot, Sherd Walters, and co-pilot Dave Scanlon, we went out to sea between Garden Island in Bunbury, and after some brief manoeuvring to get the feel of the aeroplane, we were briefed on an explosive decompression, rapid loss of cabin pressure or any other emergency that required a rapid descent. So beginning at 25,000 feet and 325 knots indicated at, up near the Barber Pole, the procedure was power off, speed brake handle, pull full out and hold, roll the aircraft over a 30 degree angle of bank, push the nose down as far as you can and dive for the sea. Now we were going down 12,000 feet per minute, which if your calculation is right is 200 feet per second. The IBSI would stop at 6,000, we went double that. Pull out was begun by 10,000 feet, to be level at 5,000 feet and it was all physical hand control on the elevators. Because it was important never to use the stab trim to relieve the elevator pressure, because when you came out of the dive, you might go nose up, stall, lose control, and you'd be in the sea even if you missed it the first time. <laughs> Fine training was routine. Initially, our F-28s went Perth, Headland, Perth, and then extended through to Darwin. In the meantime, DCA had to work out, because of the extra 10,000 pounds of aircraft weight, what runways and taxiways and tarmacs could stand the extra weight. And so they had to calculate the patent depth factors and load classification numbers. As I mentioned, being on lease, my point, Julia, we cruised at 0.725, which is about three quarters of the speed of sound for the aeroplane. And uh, Nelson Hill was in control. I was sat sitting down the back as a passenger, positioning to Headland for another flight. So on the descent into Headland, the afternoon sun, we were on the right hand side, the co pilot pointed out. I asked, what is this I see on top of the wing? And to give you a description, it was a thin, water clear, vertical line standing up on the wing, very thin, transparent, right out to the wing tip, and we could see it slowly twisting. I said, well, we must be near M crit, which is the critical speed or mark number where the wing determines the speed limit of the aeroplane because going over the top of the wing, the air is less dense, it accelerates, and that's where it gets to the critical mark number. The speed was pretty close to the speed of sound over the wing. Its effect was by temperature or air density variations. One morning we were going to Port Headland and another F-28 was coming south. 
is a new experience. Our passing speed would have exceeded 700 knots, and that's about 3,800 <coughs> kilometres an hour. So a PA was made for the passengers, and if you know the rule, both aircraft turn right, both in nautical, navy, and aviation. So the people on the left would have had a unique, because it never happened very often, observation of two aircraft passing in except 700 knots. On leaving Perth in the winter time with this higher speed aircraft, we might go up to Darwin and back the next day, the third day out of Perth again. It was interesting to see when a cold front went through, the strata cumulus cloud was being spread right up through the Pilbara to the Kimberleys. So it was very important that we knew what was happening above us or around us. But the F-28 time for me was short because I was soon back on the F-27 to get a command. Initially our F-27 flights went through Parabadu, the dirt strip at that time. One new worker <coughs> went to get off my aircraft and I lose that term, uh, use that term worker loosely as you'll hear again. Went to get off the F-27, looked out at the dusty area, said, I'm not staying here, give me a ticket, I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> Some years later on the main tarmac of Parabadu, another worker, while coming to board the aircraft, boasted that he'd just won the Battle of the Pilbara. Marvellous. He'd been there three months. <laughs> then the Pilbara slowed cash dried up, F-27 loads fell to 10%. Very soon, the aircraft was over in Melbourne, plus one of our five F-28s. At this time, Singapore and Malaysia were separating their political, social, and all other aspects of their earlier union. MSA CEO came to Perth, recruiting pilot, I had 500 hours command F-27, so very soon I was on my way to Malaysia. Up there, the F-27s for the 500 series, and they had, had a small loading door, but they also had a large cargo door. After a brief transition, went to go to Kinabalu. Kota means port, Kinabalu means fire. And once that city was destroyed by natural fire, the second time was when the Japanese came down in 1942. Saba means north. Line training was once around the traps, including one to Singapore. This is Mount Kinabalu, 13,455 feet high, 4,101 metre. It is the highest mountain in Southeast Asia, 23 to 28 miles east of KK and easily seen from the town. And the cloud shrouds it and with three ridges on the southern side, take off from the airport, we turned out to sea, climbed to a minimum of 3,500 feet to ensure that we would be well and truly above these ridges as we went east. One day while returning from Sandakan, which is to the east, I flew on the 090 radio of the VOR, being about three to four miles south of the mountain. By drifting down above the trees, I noted the distance and altitude that was a safe descent. And it simply works out DME times three plus thousand feet. So 10 miles, 3,000 plus one is four. 20 miles, 6,000 plus one is seven. 30 miles, equals 10,000 feet. So this data was given to all the new arriving pilots. Even though it's uh, the land beneath the wind, off that mountain with a northerly breeze, it could get quite a bit of turbulence. Well, in spite of the good information, needless to say, one of the other pilots who had been there a little while, told me that climbing out of KK one day wasn't paying much attention in the cloud, saw a gap, 
And there were the trees, just there, literally, under his aeroplane. So he promptly took action, and hopefully, from then on, he paid a bit more information, and paid attention to my information. Right from Kota Kanavaa, we went east to Sandakan, and probably many of you know what that means. Sandakan was the place at the beginning of the death march, where over 2,000 Australian and British troops were marched by the Japanese towards Kota Kinabalu. They finished up, those that survived, at one hour, just in the bottom of that picture. But those who died, died of hunger, dysentery, cholera, typhus, various other tropical sicknesses. There were those who fled into the jungle for safety or escape, and they died alone. Others were shot by the guards. The local practice of slash and burn for weeks, Cannabalo Airport was choked in smoke. The 737s were hard pressed and often directed down to Mary or Brunei because they couldn't get in. Cannabalo Sabo Times had several articles referring to these diversions. One added that the F 27 flights were unaffected. One of the reasons was when we first arrived in Borneo, an old MSA pilot had exhorted us to maintain the MSA high standard and reputation there, to be within 10 minutes of the schedule 98% of the time. Malaysian 242 was the first flight out of Cannavalo for Kuching. The first stop was at Labuan, an island where the Australian War Cemetery is located. When the enemy was cleared of Labuan, it became the main RAAF base for flights attacking targets further north, well into the Philippines. Colin Cook, I mentioned before, had flown from there in World War II and had been to many of the places that we spoke of. I went to Brunei, it was just 20 miles. It was often in fog. It was interesting and common to see the trees sticking up through the thick fog. And so it was normal for the tower to say, there is no other traffic when ready cleared to land. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes later. Apart from the Denham Homestead Strip near Kananara, if you've been there, Brunei Runway was by far the worst that I'd landed on. And some years later, I found one that was worse than that. But with the new airport, they put the rollers on it and made it with smooth. From Brunei, next port was Miri, also with fog. And by 300 feet, gear down, flat one to go. When we crossed a very narrow creek and over two very tall trees, it was take full flat. Keep going down to 500 feet a minute. Ah, there it is. The standard approach procedure each time ensured a safe and orderly arrival. This, well, Miri to Bintulu was easy down along the coast, over Cape Kudurong, the left base, to land to the east. But from Bintulu, usually there was low cloud, hiding all the trees, the clues. The rivers Tata, Balingian, Mooka, Oya, and Ega, which we might get a glimpse of, would be helpful. But it was good when it was thin fog, rather than thick. So on the Egan, we would pick up a large sawmill, then a river bend, another sawmill, with quick looking out, looking in, we would cross over a river, the locator needle will spin, we would put full flap on, keep going down 400 feet a minute, there was a little hut in a rice field, and just beyond that was the runway. This process was called scud running. In Kuching, Sarawa, monsoons dropped 15 feet of water, or 180 inches of rain a year, or 4.5 metres. Often, very heavy rain for several days. And slowly easing off, it becomes soggy, low cloud, and then fog is a good experience. 
Uh, being on time was a challenge we gladly took to maintain regardless of the weather. Maintenance and team support was good all round. We were a happy and efficient crew. Coming back to Mount Kinabalu, the Crocker Range descends and gently lowers down on the Sarawak and Kalimantan border. It comes to the form of a J towards the northwest and Tanjong Datu. Tanjong means Cape and importance for Datu. So if someone is titled Datu, you know he's a person of importance. Flights to Singapore required a, a climb going over Gunung Sarabi and the range to be 5,000 feet or more by 15 nautical miles. After 20 minutes, we lose radio contact from the ranges. And we would be silent for half an hour until we got Singapore on VHF. You see, HF wasn't used up there. And they weren't interested in you until you came on frequency. And then you would get certain details when you're in that area. At the time, Singapore was emerging as a solid business nation. Higher Lieber Airport was busy. But with ground control being good, whatever they asked, you could fit it in. One afternoon, going into night, we had to stay at about six and a half thousand feet over what is now Changi. And we were asked if we could make a close visual approach. So it was power off, nose down. And as we were turning on to final, still with no gear or flaps at that time, we were told, please the land when ready, take first available left. So I got the gear out and we were still taking full flap as we were touching down. First available runway at that speed. As I turned off, I looked around. There was a three-holder, DC-10 or like a 10 11 in the flare, just touching down. So we had to be versatile. From the Sakano era onwards, national security was evident. We knew that at any time we could fly past another aircraft, usually at the other altitude, of course, but it could be a Hercules, a flock of helicopters, a caribou, or the Canadian two-seat strike aircraft, the Tab one. So we kept our altitude and we kept our eyes open. Small airports only controlled up to five nautical miles. But outside that, they just gave you information like our flight service units did here. All the staff were very friendly, courteous and efficient. With the two years up, I was back in Perth. I soon did my command training at the Jack Murray at Cundon. Hadn't been there for a while, so I had to do my homework. I say it again, F-28 was my favourite aircraft. It was the best. But FKD was the fourth to arrive in Australia, and that was sent to Air New South Wales. So to fit in with the big aircraft, procedures and that, ATC required a 727 DC-9 profile to fit the F-28. So at 31,000 feet, the top of descent was 130 miles. But this procedure was far too costly for New South Wales, so FKD came to Perth. But when the younger MMA management took on and reviewed the descent profiles over here and any other place that we went to, Top of descent was reduced from 130 nautical miles down to 100. The fuel saved on each sector was 50 kilos. For each aircraft, 10, a 10 sectors a day was 500 kilos. A 9F28s was 4,500 kilos a day. Considering one week, nine aircraft, 27,000 kilos of fuel. Now, what did that cost? And what was the savings per year? When F-28s had a major check, check eight was the big one, I think it was about five weeks. The aircraft was offline and so an F-27 would come over from Melbourne. And we were the Borneo boys that had flown so much. They were <coughs> the aircraft that we were invited to stand into for those weeks. 
Well, we didn't miss the opportunity. We flew half the speed, half the height, and had twice the time. So I would fly and do everything one day, my mate would rest, and then tomorrow he'd do everything, I'd rest, but we always keep our eyes open. I would like to take a moment to reflect on the consistently very high standard of MMA's engineering. Give honour to the memory of Frank Cahoon and his dedicated team. To those who followed and faithfully pushed for and maintained the very highest standard, we always had every confidence in them. So when the ex Borneo boys flew the F-27, replacing the F-28, the DCA rule was that you couldn't fly a jet concurrently with a prop aircraft. So, with two simulator checks and two route checks every year, plus the conversion sometimes in Melbourne or Sydney, almost like a license renewal, and then you come back and you'd had to revalidate on the F-28. In a period of 36 months, I did 42 flight checks of one type or another. <laughs> you don't ask me which way's up. In the 1990s, when workers left the Pilbara, as I mentioned before, many were given a send-off. One chap was going to be married, so they naturally attached a steel ball or a chain to his leg. He had to carry it out, and I think it was about 15 kilos or more in weight. When the joke was over, it was disconnected, he got on the aeroplane, and this happened a few times. Until one day, they didn't want to take the chain off. And so you can see, the aircraft needs to go, the captain, the dispatch officer, and these fellows with the ball and chain gang, it wasn't going anywhere. Eventually, the dispatch officer was able to pretend to do something. He sneaked out the back door, jumped in his truck, brought off into town, went to the police station. And when they got involved, it was very serious. An incident as simple as that is classified as hijacking or piracy. And it's a very serious offence. The next day, three detectives flew out of Perth, went to Parabadu, have had any other problems ever since. Maybe it was because Parabadu got a special security officer who was always on duty. He come back to the F-28. When we got the aircraft, most of our mobile tankers were in gun, the F-28 gauges, were in pound. The dispatch officer brought out the load sheet in kilos. Along the line, this conversion from Imperial to the decimal system, on July 23rd, 1983, in the US, an Air Canada 767, a low in fuel and had to make a specific landing on a disused racing motor racing track. The different indications and calculations on that, they had much less than what was expected. So we had to do a real hasty calculation, gallons, pounds, kilos so that we ran out the tables, gave it to everyone so that we could go down through the list and say this equals this and that equals that. Because we didn't want to have those zeros in our life. Well back in Perth you may or may not know that fog is closed Perth Airport on any day or night right throughout the year. The 30 minutes that office review was to accurately remove the risk of fog being a problem at the airport by closing the rate of wet and dry bulbs two degrees apart. This was done every 30 minutes, but sometimes that information was not passed on to the pilots. Pilots were often trained and reminded to work out their diversion point of Mount Magnet or the latest allergy because every now and again someone could be five or six minutes out and they say oh fog's forming you'll have to go somewhere else and we haven't got any fuel to go somewhere else so we will land check early and be prepared
This is our blue, I think it'll be harping on parent blue, but this is a good one. Hot summer winds and thermals. From the early age when I pushed a bike to school, from the age of six, they called them beastly easterns. And then coming home in the afternoon, there'd be a strong sea breeze, and I'd be puffing and huffing again. At Perth, the Darlington Valley is more like a channel where these strong winds flow more smoothly. But if you get around further to the south, the wind off Gooseberry Hill, and further towards Kalamunda, very rough and very significant. Approaches were made at 1.2 VS, which is 20% over the stalling speed for that bike. Ordinarily, you approach speed to be 110 knots plus five of variations. But with these easterlies, you can finish up with 20 knots added. But a headwind reduces the distance of your landing roll. So one afternoon, I was coming into Perth, the sign runway 06. The gusts, the wind shear, I promptly added 20 knots. On final, 400 feet, the bottom fell out of it. The store warning, alarm, blared, the stick shake, a rattle, and the speed buffer of 20 knots was gone. But, being an F-28, it simply bounced back up again. We made a normal landing. We went to Kalgoorlie and back that night. So coming back, I requested runway 20. Made a normal, smooth landing. I went up to ATC and discussed it with them and went to the car park with my co-pilot and before we got there we saw the OAC 747 lined up on 06 and literally his nav lights were going from above the fuselage to below the fuselage naturally he couldn't control it he did a missed approach went away Next time he came in much lower, more determined, another missed approach, he went away. After the third missed approach, we're wondering, why is he still doing this? He disappeared for about 20 minutes, came in on runway 20. Shortly after, there was a Qantas 747. Well, he reenacted, did two missed approaches, went away and landed on 20. Very soon after that, the Singapore 747 came in. One missed approach, went away, landed on 20. So a few days later at flight planning, I spoke to one, one of the ATC fellas, and I said, this is what I said and what I experienced. And I wondered why these guys were making so many approaches on 06. And the answer was, Simply, the DCA policy of the day and the procedure was to nominate the runway most into wind. Logical. Then it was up to the pilot to decide what to do. What did it cost the airlines? However, instructions are instructions, but there is no substitute for local knowledge and experience when added to wisdom and sound judgment. In the hot weather, if you've never descended into Derby, it can be pretty bumpy. So I would greet the passengers, delay my descent, take flight idle, put the nose down, speed brake, and descend down through the thermal. Might have been a bit steeper, but it wasn't as bumpy. So on takeoff, through 12 or 15,000 feet, you were above it all. They probably gathered that I really enjoyed flying the F-28 and I think after 18 years I've got something to be proud of. In summary, MMA's engineers were good and I enjoyed all my 25 years working with them. One example in closing. At Caratha one day the APU shut down and wouldn't start. The APU produced air to go through the engine starter motors so uh, we weren't going anywhere. I rang Perth and spoke to Ken Holmes, the engineer. He said, oh, I've been working on this through the night. 
He said, can you get a long screwdriver, open up the APU panel? He said, and put it in the back right hand corner, and shake it around a bit and see if you can agitate this ground flight switch. So it can do. Got a trolley, got up inside after I briefed the co-pilot and the ground crew. I said, as soon as he gets the air pressure, get him to start the engine. Well, I'm doing this. The APU is still running. Tug on my trousers. I jump down, shut the box, closed up, trolley and screwdriver away, got up on board, passengers on board, shut the door, off we went, 10 minutes late, making up time. It was done quickly and efficiently, with minimum of fuss, because we knew the aircraft, we had good rapport with our staff. It was easy to solve problems and all worked together to keep the airline running. They were truly great times. Thank you one and all. Thank you.